Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our uh, series uh, for PIs from South America. And we have the pleasure and the honor to start today with Dr. Bob Verde. He is the CEO of Cosmos Scientific. This organization uh, conducts clinical trials for experimental medical devices. Uh, we are, uh, they, they do, they are a CRO, a contract research organization based in Colombia. Kudos to Colombia. <laughs> and uh, um, in South America, which offers diverse services to companies innovating in healthcare technologies. So here we are, Dr. Valverde. Awesome. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure <laughs> meeting with you. Uh, it's been a, it's an honor for me, and it's really pleasant, really an honor, and really fun to be with you again today. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you for accepting our invitation and for spending time with us here. So, uh, we would like to to hear more about all the regulations and all the the process that uh, happen in Colombia when you are doing uh, clinical research. Um, obviously, uh, you specialize in medical devices, but I'm, I'm thinking or I'm assuming that is kind of similar to the uh, pharmaceutical too. So uh, obviously I'm gonna let you speak about that because you're the expert. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Monica. So, so I would like to mention a few aspects about the government in Colombia and the regulations and why we do things we do it in Colombia we we have a, uh, you know a government a presidency that also has several ministries and one of them obviously is the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Health is the one that uh, issues all the regulations uh, to manage the health care of the globe of the Colombian population so we also have uh, our local regulatory agency which is DIMA which is the, the, the agency that takes care of uh, approving and, and doing all these uh, surveillance of healthcare products. So it's like uh, our local FDA. So this, these two entities, I mean, the INVIMA, which is a regulatory agency, is following the orders of the Ministry of Health to guarantee that the Colombian population is receiving uh, safe and effective and high quality products. So also on one of the, the activities at INVIMA is the approval of regulatory and regulatory processes for clinical trials, for medical devices, for pharmaceuticals, and for other healthcare products. So this, this, this uh, agency has several boards, specialized boards, and in our case, we work with the specialized boards on medications or pharmaceuticals. And the other one is the specialized boards for medical devices. Uh, so these two uh, boards are, are the ones that are gonna be reviewing our, all our protocols, all our documents, and are gonna authorize us to conduct clinical trials in Colombia uh, to import experimental technologies like pharmaceuticals, medical devices, vaccines, biotechnology products, and, and everything that we could use to improve the health of the Colombian and global population. So, so one of the uh, things that we use always uh, are, you know, we have several regulations that we have to consider that are based on, on the regulating uh, healthcare facilities. So we have regulations for medical practices, for pharmaceutical services, for laboratory services, and for every kind of service that you can working to provide uh, health care to Colombian population. So these regulations have to be followed by everyone that is conducting clinical trials also. And specifically for clinical trials, we follow like two big regulations, which are Resolution 8430, which uh, gives you the guidelines to conduct ethical clinical trials and to conduct other uh, research studies. And we have the other one, which is Resolution 2378, which is a list of requirements. It's around 96 pages quality requirements for clinical uh, facilities. 
If you want to conduct clinical trials in Colombia, you have to comply with this list of requirements. So uh, as you can imagine, this is a very strict process and it's based on the document of good clinical practice. I think this is a very uh, unique situation. I don't think it's existing in any other country. Maybe, maybe it is, but, but this is very specific for a country because our regulatory agency is a part of the ICH and they decided to use all this information on all these guidelines and make them a law. So by law, you have to provide extremely high quality clinical research services in your medical facilities. So, so I think it's a very good advantage that our clinical research sites in Colombia have because we, we, we know how to do things and we follow all these guidelines that are based on international re recommendations and you know, it helps us to conduct safe, ethical, and successful clinical trials in Colombia. Well, wow, that's very interesting uh, to to know that uh, there are many, that there are a lot of regulations, and it's not like a, uh, I mean, because a lot of people will probably think that it's not as regulated probably as it is in the United States. But according to what you're mentioning, it's probably even more regulated and more strict in Colombia than uh, probably we imagine. How long does it take, for, a, for example, for a site or for a clinic to establish uh, like a brand new clinic uh, and, and uh, making sure that they are under all these regulations? Well, that depends. I mean, uh, we uh, we have work in our company. We have worked with several, a couple of clinical research with, I mean, medical facilities that wanted to create clinical research sites. And once you can, you know, uh, get all your manual, quality manual, you have all your standard operating procedures, and, and you train your doctors and all the staff at the at the clinical research site. Uh, you have to make your pharmaceutical service to be compliant with this guideline, also with the clinical laboratory or blood sampling uh, uh, office. I mean, if, once you have all the documents and once you train your team, uh, it, it can take, you know, around a month if you work really hard with your team. And then you uh, request a visit from, from Indima and they spend a week with, with you working just to verify that you're compliant with all these guidelines and regulations and that you will do things properly uh, and then you can say that in a couple of months three months stop you can have a certified site so it's a it's a very uh, important process uh, i think it's very good for us and uh, i think a lot of several sites in colombia have done and we have around 120 sites that have been certified by indima to conduct clinical trials for pharmaceutical Wow. Okay. So, uh, for example, if 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 you're starting a new study, like a clinic is starting a new study, from the the moment that they get uh, awarded the study until the uh, I mean, I'm I'm just trying to put it in perspective because uh, obviously uh, the processes are different, right? So, from the moment that the site gets awarded the study until the moment that they can start. Um, uh, screening patients for that specific study, how long will it take a site uh, to, to be up and running in that study? Yeah, well, actually, you have to take uh, to consider several steps, uh, but I, I would guess, uh, I'll explain later, but I would, I would say that we, we can aim to have a study approved and to, to be ready to start recruiting patients in around uh, six months. I would say that a perfect timeline would be four to five months, uh, but, but I would say around six months is a, is a proper number. Uh, it, it's very important because in Colombia, we, we have, you know, most, most of the international CROs and we have an association of, of clinical research professionals. We have an association of clinical research sites and we have an association of pharmaceutical companies and they all work together with our regulatory agency, which is in Lima, to try to, you know, to work and improve the processes and timelines in Colombia to be attractive to 
you know, got two sponsors to conduct clinical trials in Colombia. So I think there's a close communication with uh, all these involved parties and in Bima, and it has uh, one of the goals of Inbima recently has been to reduce this timeline uh, because it, it was around four to six months. They're trying to make it happen in three months, and uh, I think and this, this is going to happen. So, but besides, you know, besides uh, getting the approval by Inbima, first you have to go through the ethics committee for every site, and several sites have weekly meetings. Some some of them have only one once a month. But uh, you can add like around a month for the full process of uh, approval for your clinical trial. And then we will work with the importation of pharmaceuticals and devices that you have them ready uh, for your sites. So I would say that a safe number is uh, five to six months. But that's including getting the protocol approved or is, or is just uh, uh, for the, when the site gets the study? Since the moment uh, that you submit documents to your ethics committee until you get approved by being. Oh, okay. 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 So, the, it, okay, so, got it. Yeah, and it's really short, shorter for medical devices. This is for the pharmaceutical uh, board, special ad board on pharmaceuticals. For my medical devices, it's quicker uh, because we, we aim to three to four months because INVIMA meets every month and has uh, four weeks in advance submission. And the, re the response of the evaluations, we get them around a couple of weeks after the meeting. So I always say to my sponsors, since the moment you give me the document until you do the site initiation visit, it's in medical devices, four to five months and in pharmaceuticals around six months. Okay, and uh, uh, in BIMA, to put it in perspective, in BIMA is kind of like the IRB? Uh, the, we don't call them IRBs. We call them here something like uh, uh, ethics committees, and we have one for every site. And then once you get the approval by the ethics committee, then you go to the BIMA, which is equivalent to the FDA, not to the IRB. Oh, okay, that's what, I, that's what mm -hmm. I was a little confused. Okay, so... Uh, if, if a, each, so that means that each side have their own uh, committee, et, ethics committee team. That means that it's like, it's like when you apply here to a local IRB. So it's not, it's not yes. one. Yes, uh, in Colombia we have. Okay. Yeah, sorry. The, okay. the resolution 2378 says that you can have your own clinical ethics committee uh, in your site, and you get you can get the INVIMA uh, certification on good clinical practice for your clinical research office and for your own ethics committee, or you have the option to work with an external and independent ethics committee. So there are ethics committees that work for several clinical research sites. Some of them only work for their own clinical research sites. And also there are sites that they don't have an ethics committee and they work with external. I don't know if that's clear. Uh, so th no, so that is similar here because we have here the central IRB, which is for uh, the one that the sponsor choose and, and all the sites that mm -hmm. are with that, uh, with that the study or with that sponsor doing that study uh, get to do it with the central IRB unless they are, um, uh, regulated, but what by one of the local IRBs, in which case they will have to go with the local IRB, right? So it's basically the same. <laughs> it's yes, just, it uh, is. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's just the, okay. Um, and then, um, okay, so if, if, if it, okay, takes six months, around six months to get this study up and running in one clinic. And usually, um, when when they for, for example for a CRO to look for the sites is when you say you have a hundred and a hundred and how many a hundred and something 20 okay those are registered with your CRO or that's or that's uh, the the total amount of sites registering in in Colombia that's the total amount of sites that have, that have been certified by EMA. Although there are some other sites that don't get, they don't have this 
studies in case by Lima. They just run different kind of studies that are you not know, experimental, pharmaceuticals, and and they they have some limitations, but they also they also have some activity. Mm-hmm. Oh, and and okay. and some most of the CROs uh, they can reach out to all these 120 sites and depending on their resources and capabilities, they can assign studies to these sites. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so this these are this uh, the this 123 are registered within Bima, like like uh, like you were mentioning in Bima, it's like the FDA in Colombia. Okay, so that means that if you're doing research, you don't have to or you uh, uh, to really register in Bima to be doing research. Uh, obviously, you will have. You will not, uh, you will have limitations like you mentioned, but you still be able to do research. Yeah, but not clinical trials for experimental pharmaceuticals. That's your limitation. You can do like a, you know, observational studies. You can do uh, economic evaluations like burden of building studies, quality of life, uh, cost effectiveness studies, uh, prevalence, incidence, uh, and some studies for. Uh, phase four pharmaceuticals and 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 uh, for medical devices because they are not uh, they they, are, they don't require to get the certificate but uh, you know there are some limitations I think the big, big industry requires you to to get this the certificate to, to be a part of a of the global clinical trials industry. Okay, well, uh, that that sounds. Uh, I mean, that sounds to me that. Is 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 a obviously a highly regulated, um, a, um, I mean, in Colombia is highly regulated. It's a sector is highly regulated in Colombia, so it's not like it's not taking, um, it's not a joke. <laughs> and and obviously, if no, if these clinics are doing, I mean, are, are these clinics the majority like large organizations or or some of these are small? Uh, I think uh, we have uh, m- m- several of these sites are from big clinics, like with big buildings and all the services and a really prestigious clinic. And some of them are smaller, like let's say that some of them are only outpatient visits with a uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, service and with a blood sampling uh, office. But some of them are, you know, we call them high level uh, site which have every possible service that you might encounter might find in the in a medical facility including you know uh, words uh, intensive care units uh, surgery and all these services that you you can find in a big facility so as you might imagine most of uh, medical facilities in Colombia are uh, first level or first or second level and the third level of facilities are a, really, a number a smaller number not a really huge number but a smaller number than the outpatient clinics but you have the possibility of creating and certifying a site for every level of care in Colombia okay and then my next question is in regards to the the phase the phase one and then phase two three and four what's the majority of these clinics uh, uh, specialize on or are they doing all the all the phases or most of these clinics do phase two and up until a few years ago we were running studies from phase two and, and above let's say uh, but recently, uh, medical facilities start working because the, the INVIMA also got a process to certify your site to conduct uh, uh, studies for bioequivalence and bioavailability for genetic products. So, you know, you have to do them on early studies on healthy volunteers and you have to... Uh, have all the structures and processes to conduct these type of studies. So I think recently, in the last few years, we we also have the resources to do phase one studies. Although I think this is not the majority of what we do in Colombia. We we mostly do phase two and three, and uh, and recently the number of phase one and bioequivalent studies is is raising. 
Okay, and I'm curious. I don't know if you have the answer for this, but is is uh, how uh, how is people uh, the general population um, idea about clinical trials? Is the is the population responded responding to this, or or are they more uh, like I mean, do they have more taboo about it, or how is it there? Uh, this is this is a very interesting question, and there are several things to to mention about. The first one is that uh, in Colombia we have a uh, 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 healthcare uh, system that has what we call the global coverage because we have more than 96% of our population included in this healthcare system. So we, I mean, most of uh, our Colombians have access to healthcare. And in Colombia, the patients are, you know, really trusted their physicians, and they always do what the physicians recommend. Most of the time, you know, you always find people that, you know, they want to do some research about this, and they want to talk to the relatives and their, their family members and friends and their personal doctor, and some of them, they don't get into the trials because several conditions or several opinions, but, but I think the process in this way is perfect because what we want in our clinical trials are patients that want to participate in, in our studies and to be completely sure that they want to uh, be involved in receiving a new technology. And, you know, we all know what our process is and our objective is when we run a clinical trial. So I think this is a, a very good situation just to be sure that we are uh, helping people. Uh, most of the patients in Colombia have access to this healthcare. And some of them have received previous treatments that might not be effective and they need an alternative. And I think we can provide that with clinical trial. So my opinion is that yes, and my experience is that most of the patients always consult with their relatives and that's what we want them to do. And there are some patients that are not included in the studies because they don't want to, but the majority of our patients, they follow you know, the physician's uh, instructions and receive their guidance and the guide and the information. And, and I think most of them get into the trial. Okay, that, that's actually great to hear because that means that then Colombia could uh, potentially become a, um, a diversity hub <laughs> for yeah. clinical trials. It's refreshing to hear that. And then... Um, okay, so I, uh, th that's great to hear. And then on top of that, I wanted to ask you if the patients in Colombia get paid for participating in clinical trials. No, we don't, we don't pay the patients. I mean, I think uh, the process, what we do here is that we compensate them for possible expenses if they have to visit the site and, and expenses for them and for their relatives, let's say the transport to the medical facility, or maybe for the launch or whatever expense they may might incur and by visiting the site, uh, but we don't we don't pay them. I mean, we don't want to to influence their decision of participating in a clinical trial by you know paying them by putting their the money over the help. And this is one of the things that we are very careful with because this is what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, exactly. That's, I, I ask you those questions. I already knew the answers, <laughs> but I ask you that questions just because I, I, I want the organizations and the, the world in United States are, are out there to understand and learn this from, from the processes in Colombia. And, and, and obviously because it's, it's a great opportunity for organizations that are looking to bring diversity and I'm sure every single organization right now is, is, is looking to bring diversity uh, and especially from the population, from the minorities like Latino community, like the Hispanic community. And, and, and sometimes uh, organizations, pharmaceutical companies probably overlook these opportunities that uh, South, uh, countries like South America in South America or countries in maybe in Africa 
could offer to the industry and bring that so important uh, diverse group of uh, participants. And, and, and it's also important that the, uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry and the uh, uh, and device industry knows that uh, it's a highly regulated um, industry in Colombia. Uh, so it's, it's not like they are getting, uh, I mean, they are getting quality of data uh, because they know it's, 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 I mean, obviously because it's regulated and then also because the patients are not motivated uh, for nothing else than the real uh, uh, benefit of their health. I mean, in the case that the benefit, right? Because yeah. uh, obviously these are not treatments that, that yet until they get approved. Um, yeah, so you were going to say something, Ashley? <laughs> yeah, and I thanks for saying that, Monica, because um, by the way, great questions. You know, I was just getting really into it. Um, but going on from what you just said, um, I think also, you know, the reason why the patients, and this is ob obviously a, an issue in the U.S., right, and um, hopefully the solution can be, you know, figured out or something, but um, part of the issue is that, you know, the Latino, the Hispanic community, um, they trust, right, they're trusting the, 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 the PIs, they're trusting their physicians, they feel uh, they're able to go to them and, you know, put their health in their hands and, and also, you know, not necessarily want to get paid, but, you know, they get their services paid for in, in order to get to the actual, um, you know, facilities, et cetera, right? And in order to do that, in order to facilitate that trust is to have, you know, the language barrier, one, right? And obviously in Colombia, everybody speaks Spanish, right? Or, uh, you know, any different types of dialect that, that might be there. And so there's, clear consenting, there's clear communication, there's clear understanding. Uh, and obviously because of, you know, the region, right? Um, any type of educational documentation resources and things like that are all translated. So I do feel like that's a huge um, uh, far end on, on the U.S. side, right? I think we, we lack in that area very, very greatly. Um, but I was curious, Dr. Valerde, uh, do you, over there in Colombia, is there, um, since it's the global healthcare, um, I'm assuming that the CROs or the sponsors, they, um, well, more specifically, probably the CROs, the, the amount of resources that are provided, maybe not, you wouldn't know in the clinical trials particularly, but when pharmaceutical and medical devices, um, are there a lot of resources provided to, to the patients when they go through? Oh, so, so about the resources, what, 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 it, what I said before is that uh, we try to make things easier for the patients. We try to you know, to not make them incur in, in unnecessary expenses or unnecessary rates on clinical trials. And uh, we try to cover all the, the, the possible expenses and possible inconveniences that a, may, a patient might uh, face when, you know, getting involved in a clinical trial. So uh, there, there's, there's something that we have to be really careful with and, uh, and it's, it's trying not to influence, as I mentioned before, patients to participate in the study with any any resource that is different to uh, focus uh, medical attention and uh, in this case focus on the participation of the patients in the clinical trial. So so yes, uh, the patients are. I mean, we try to you know when you receive a, a sponsor, you try to plan for everything that's going to happen in the study and to make sure that they have enough resources to conduct the study. Uh, from the principle from the beginning to the end, and actually, this is one of the things that the ethics committee and the Lima evaluate when assessing a clinical trial. The budgets are fundamental uh, for the studies, just to to understand that we will have the, enough resources to take a good care of our patients. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Lucy. Yes, most definitely. Thank you. And. Um, and something that, I mean, uh, at least on the clinical trial side of things, um, you know, we do hear, and I think Monica can agree and, and Chris can too, we do hear sometimes that it's sometimes more difficult to get, you know, uh, a study in, you know, in Mexico or South America sometimes. And after hearing, you know, your explanation of how thorough the regulatory uh, process is, you know, I find that, you know, interesting because I would assume that it would be that much more easier, especially with the fact that they have access, right, to a more diverse patient population. Um, from the medical devices perspective, do you do you feel that it sometimes can be difficult to get sponsor studies, or not so much? 
Yeah, but what I what I think is that there's enough enough information for sponsors when deciding to come to to a country like Colombia. But uh, but I think this is a very good opportunity to make them understand that we are in Colombia trying to run high quality clinical trials. That we have a regulatory agency that is friendly for clinical trials and sponsors. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's you know relaxed. It's a very strict process that is as it is in any other country, but we we might we must know that in Lima is there's a ranking for regulatory agencies worldwide worldwide according to their quality and what they can do and their experience, and in Lima is is very well ranked worldwide in a in a in this ranking. <laughs> so so and the other thing that we must understand is that one of the requirements for FDA, from FDA in order to accept clinical trials run overseas, and there are several items that we have to comply with, and one of them is that they follow the strict, I mean, they follow the local process, the local regulatory process, and in this case, that is, you know, uh, is, is the process is, uh, followed by Invima. So if you get, let's say that you get the, the study conducted by uh, the, clinic, the good clinical practice guidelines, that uh, you get the approval by the ethics committee and you get the approval by a regulatory agency that in this case is very well uh, experienced, this is it's gonna make easier uh, for, for the sponsors to get these patients that were included in the study and this information obtained by the study to get approved by the FDA and other uh, international agencies. I'm not sure if I was clear on that, but uh, it, I think this is very important for the sponsors. That's actually wonderful information. So that way they, they fully understand how, how it works in Colombia. <laughs> Uh, so, um, anybody has any questions? Thanks, sorry, Monica. I got uh, my dog was barking very loud in the background. Oh, no, no worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer, Dr. Valverde. Uh, super, super no, good no, information. No. I do think that it's important that we bring this awareness, you know, to to CROs and to sponsors because it's, you know, if if your regulatory you know process is that thorough, I mean, there should be no reason as to why there's not more you know, uh, collaboration happening, right? More opportunities being spread throughout both North and South America. Um, hopefully, you know, we can maybe do something to, to kind of help bridge that knowledge gap. Because I mean, clearly, you know, if they, if they would be knowing this kind of information, I would assume that there'd be a lot more trials going on, a lot more diversity uh, being provided into these studies. So thank you so much for everything you do. You're very welcome, Ashley. And one of the things that I would add to this is that uh, the process in Colombia, as in, in any other country, has you know like very specific details that are not difficult to follow, but you need to know that you have to follow them in order to you know make a process clear. So my advice is you you have to as a sponsor uh, to try to work with someone local and that understand all the regulations, the processes the documents, what have been the Invima's requirements for specific uh, clinical trials and, uh, and if it's a pharmaceutical or medical device, the process is different. So, so I think uh, it, it's re regrettable that as a country, we sometimes uh, have lost clinical trials to run in our country because uh, the process was not followed properly and it does, it does not, it's not a fault of a sponsor, but maybe it's our fault as, you know, Colombian people working in clinical trials, uh, we, we could help them better. But, but in, 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 even, happen, in, even with this situation, we, we, we have a growing number of clinical trials in Colombia, and I think it's a reflection of, what, of the regulations, of the quality, of the interest of the medical community in Colombia to be a participant in the global clinical trials into three and, you know, you have to provide high quality uh, services 
in this in this uh, process just to make sure that our patients are safe. So so I think I think yeah, there's an opportunity in our country for for companies interested in running clinical trials and uh, and you know I'll be happy to help. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Doctor, actually, uh, will please tell us a little bit about your organization, your Cosmos Scientific. Yes, yeah, well, what what our company does is, is uh, we 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 provide consultancy services on clinical research, and we are focused on conducting. Uh, clinical trials for experimental medical devices. So although we mostly work for medical devices, clinical trials and companies, we also consult in Colombia from pharmaceutical companies in the areas of uh, uh, clinical research, in Colombian regulations in healthcare, and uh, in pharmacoeconomic and health economic studies, in bioequivalent studies, and you know, uh, different areas. In, all of almost all of them related to clinical research, uh, but our most our biggest experience is conducting clinical trials for experimental medical devices. So we, I could say that our experience includes uh, in the areas of ophthalmology, we have run clinical trials for intraocular lenses for cataract and practice surgery, and we have conducted uh, studies for glaucoma devices. Uh, we've done studies for mechanical thromectomy devices for acute ischemic stroke, um, mitral valve repair, and peripheral arterectomy and for peripheral artery disease, and different types of medical devices, which everyone needs a completely different process, uh, different logistics and it's a, like uh, we mentioned in uh, another conference, Monica, it's a completely different industry, I think. Uh, but it's really, really interesting. And, and this is what we've been doing for about nine years in Colombia. And uh, I think uh, it is a very nice experience. We have, uh, as we said before, a very well-structured regulatory process. The INVIMA is uh, experienced in these kinds of studies. Uh, we have a, a full network of sites. Right now, we are structuring a site network in ophthalmology with around eight sites for one study and for other possible studies that we might have in ophthalmology. And uh, yeah, we're here to help to help uh, all these companies innovating in healthcare technologies and that are interested in, in running studies in our country. Thank you so much, doctor, for giving us some light <laughs> in the regulatory and how everything works in Colombia. Because, uh, uh, I mean, most of us uh, will have no idea, and, and I'm sure a lot of the uh, uh, pharmaceutical organizations or organizations creating or developing new technology also sometimes uh, are unaware of this information. And that's why we decided to do this uh, PI series uh, with uh, doctors from South America that uh, to explain us the processes in each uh, country because it, it varies. And then also it's important to know how um, uh, the, the timing and the, and the, uh, the processes uh, so that way these organizations or these companies here in the United States have a better idea and, uh, and will start, uh, uh, I mean, uh, um, having in the, in the map <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at the countries, right? So, and, 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 and also to, to, to let uh, the world know that in South America, and like I was saying, uh, also in Africa, there are great opportunity to do research and to bring that so important, diverse group of people participating in studies uh, and get this data. And especially if we know that this data is, is going to be clean, clean and quality, right? So uh, I, I really appreciate uh, all this information. And uh, we all really appreciate this information and, and obviously your time. Um, and uh, this is perfect timing for anybody. Uh, if anybody wants uh, to ask something, I don't know, maybe 
someone from the team, Chris, Dan, Ashley. <laughs> yeah. We'll give it to give. I'll give it a quick minute for Chris or or any of the team before I go on because I know that I also kind of hogged it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have yeah. a I have a quick question, Monica, to Doctor. Yes, hi. Hi, Adeline. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Monica. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Nice to nice to see your um uh, uh, your little picture emoji. <laughs> <laughs> for a change, I love you and your boys. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. you my uh, you as well. Uh, so, um, doctor, I have just one question uh, for you. I'm just curious. What kind of other biggest ethnic population of patients that you see in South America? What kind of adult population is your question? Ethnic, ethnic. Ah, ethnic, ethnic population. So we don't we don't have a okay we we let let I could say that we basically are a mixed uh, ethnic uh, culture. Uh, you know, we are Latin, we, we, we have African Colombian communities, we also have white communities, uh, we, but we don't call ourselves white in Colombia, we, we call, you know, we are a mixed community. But in Colombia, we have uh, different immigrating cultures in, in some cities, most of it in the north of Colombia. Uh, we have immigrants from, from Lebanon, from Germany, mm -hmm. from China, from from different countries that I maybe I don't remember remember them more at this moment, but but in, in areas like in the north coast of Colombia we have uh, uh, several group of immigrants, but but in Colombia we say exclusively Colombian. We have a big African Colombian population in huh. in in a couple of areas in, in the Pacific coast and also in the northern coast of Colombia in the Atlantic and. Uh, but we, we have immigrants from several countries that, you know, have been here for decades. And then you can see uh, different ethnic uh, cultures in Colombia. But I wouldn't say that we have, we are white people here. We would say that I, we are a mixed community with uh, an influence of external cultures too. Mm, okay, exactly. so what's the largest uh, like uh, uh, therapeutic indication or disease prevalence that you see in your um, clinics, in your sites? Well, we yeah, we we have a uh, huge populations of chronic non-transmittable diseases. I mean, hypertension, diabetes, mm -hmm. cardiovascular yeah. diseases, diseases. Yeah. Uh, basically, this is most the most. Uh, experience therapeutic area in Colombia, cardiovascular, endocrinology. And if you, if you ask me about uh, uh, possible population for pharmaceutical studies. And, right. uh, but if you ask me my, my specific experience, I, I have worked in several studies in endovascular, which include cardiovascular, neurovascular, peripheral arterial uh, diseases. And in ophthalmology, we have, I think, you know, maybe cataract surgery is one of the most conducted surgery worldwide. So we, we have an, an, a very high activity of ophthalmology uh, uh, procedures and clinics in, in Colombia. And I think this is uh, a therapeutic area that is having a lot of activity recently. Mm -hmm. Um, I just one more last question. Like you were talking about device, right? Medical device. So, what kind of medical device trials are you doing right now? Uh, we we are conducting one study for an intraocular lens. We are about to start a study for a, a mechanical thrombectomy device for acute ischemic stroke. I think this is one of the most impressive advances in medicine in the last five years. Because recently, until 2015, uh, the only treatment for acute ischemic stroke, for a clot in your brain, was mm. giving uh, medicines uh, mm. to try to dilute that clot. And, clot, and obviously, these uh, medicines have serious side effects like bleeding, and they were not always effective. 
And awesome. most of our population in third world countries with an acute ischemic stroke mm-hmm. you know, can, can have like uh, limitations for the rest of their lives and, you know, lose their capacities and their motor skills and they become fully dependent on their relatives. And now yeah. they, they, they take a catheter, they yeah. put it into your brain, through, the, through your groin, into your brain, they capture the clothes. And they take it out. And then you can see, it's really impressive that you can see the clot in the tip of a catheter. And the patient recovers their neurological uh, function immediately. That's, that's, I think, for, for us as physicians, that's something extremely ah. impressive. And it's a satisfaction to see that people can help our patients in this way. That is very impressive, but horrible mental imagery. (laughs) (laughs) I know, right? Next time you should show us pictures, like, you know, like a little (laughs) procedure, like. (laughs) That's a good one. That's amazing. It's not not, not funny, it's not beautiful, but, you know, the the life expectancy or the the survival rate of these patients has increased a lot. And for third country uh, populations, this is a huge uh, advan- advantage in, you know, in, in people receiving this kind of healthcare. So uh, I still, um, I've, known for, I've known that for about three years and I'm still impressed. It's, it's amazing, amazing. Well, thank yeah. you, thank you. Thank you, Doctor, very nice talking to you. Thank you, thank you, Monica. Monica, mm-hmm. nice to see you as well. Mm-hmm. Adeline, thank, thank you, you so much for, for those questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank very, you. Very good yeah. questions. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, I found that study pretty impressive, and I hope that a treatment or that device actually gets approved and go out in the market, because imagine uh, it, it will transform literally the life of somebody that gets uh, one of this, uh clots in the yeah. brain i mean <laughs> wow yeah, yeah. but monica the, the, these, there are several devices that are already in the market for this type we're just helping a new company to get their device approved uh, for to run a clinical trial but since 2015 these devices are already in the market and are helping people oh so wow well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. wonderful to learn Six years later. (laughs) (laughs) Gotta get a little bit more knowledge in the medical device field, right? Yeah. (laughs) We're so focused. No, I think, I think, yeah, I mean, this is, I think this area of medical devices gives gives you, as a healthcare provider, the opportunity to be in touch with so many new advances. And you, every time I'm in touch with the, new design of a new device i'm impressed i mean this is i don't know how people how where they get these ideas but this is some amazing things that you can be in touch working in this industry and as i told you monica before in another conference it's it's a satisfaction as a physician to help in any way you know even if no one knows that you were there uh, you know to make things happen and to make to help a company to, you know, to to prove that a device is safe and effective, and in the future it can help our population. This is, uh, I go to sleep really happy when this this happens. You know. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Doctor. Like honestly, you you give us a lot of uh, great information today. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, definitely want to learn a little bit more on devices. No, no. That's actually. Personally, I kind of want to go into um, the biotech uh, industry because I, I do find a device uh, devices really, really inspirational, especially with, you know, the fact that we're heavy in data and AI and technology right now. I feel like this just it's going to get become an even bigger wave of uh, of this specific uh, industry. Right. And sector of the industry. So uh, I think that's awesome. And, and I agree when you see it work, especially if you see it work in like in in person, I actually shadowed a physician, a neurosurgeon for a few hours, uh, like I think a few, maybe a hundred and some hours. Uh, and I actually got to see um, a complete uh, a spinal recovery, you know, and they actually, typically that surgery was about seven to 10 hours, depending on how severe the case was. 
and that I was actually in the in the actual uh, operating room when they were doing their very first within the region where I'm from. Uh, the very first using a, it was called like a GPS locator technology. So they actually, you know, did put the patient through an MRI so that they could um, detect where exactly the pins were as they were kind of structuring the rod on the back. And uh, the the surgery went from seven point I think five or eight hours down to two hours. It was very fast and it was wow. precise. You got you got to see as the nail was going in. They cut. They actually had it on the GPS monitor. It was the most mind blowing thing I had ever seen and experienced, and it was a uh, pretty pretty interesting. And that's why for me, that's kind of why I'm like really pushed towards that area. But um, yeah, everything you're doing um, in in the background is really making a huge uh, a huge dent, right? Especially in the South American region, right? And, and then ultimately echoing throughout because what you do in South America and that data ultimately helps. The rest of the world within you know our population so thank you for the work that you do and yeah we appreciate you being here with LICR yeah, today yeah. and and uh, hopefully we can collaborate more as we as we continue to grow that'd be great yeah yeah, yeah. of course we're gonna be in touch yeah there are so many things that I, you know I would like to you know tell you about everyone that I have every every device that I have been in touch you know one one is really funny I have you know, I'm over 40, obviously, in case you didn't notice. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, mean, I have my OP, and after 40, I already got presbycia. I don't know how you say that in English. I'm, pre I'm presbyopic, something like that. So I have to use one lens to see for near vision and one lens for far vision. Oh, wow. So oh. what they're doing right now is, they have intraocular lenses. At the beginning, they were monofocal that you use uh, for, let's say, near vision, far vision, but then you have to use glasses to read. Now, they create the bifocal intraocular lenses. They put it into your eyes, and you can see, you can read, and you can see far away. Wow. And now, the new kind of, of intraocular lens, is a, it accommodates as your eyes regularly does. Wow. So, if you have, if you use the same lens that is inside your eye to read, to, for near vision, for intermediate vision, and for far vision. Wow! So it, it's amazing, you know. Yeah. It's, I don't know how they do that, and it's it's, it's, it's awesome. amazing. It's really, really great innovation at its finest. That's awesome. Thank yeah, you. It's that's fascinating. Always fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> first time I've heard of that. So that's that's pretty great. <laughs> well, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, we're three minutes in already to wrapping it up. I don't know, Monica, did you want to say end it with anything or we're good to go? No, I'm, I'm actually fascinated by all this information. And and uh, like uh, like you were saying, uh, Ashley, thank you so much, doctor, for what you do. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, we hope we can keep on uh, working and collaborating together and see how can we bring yeah. this diversity group of population to the uh, at, at clinical research industry. Yes. Thank, thank you, you, Monica. So thank you, as always, for, for your invitation, for thinking about me and for giving me the opportunity to talk about what I really enjoy and what I do. Thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you. And for everybody here, thank you for showing today. We really appreciate it. Uh, Tuesday, October 19th, we will be having uh, the second version of our PI series with Dr. Tapia. Uh, please do not miss out. If you have any questions or any types of questions you'd like us to ask in advance, please reach out to us. But other than that, thank you. you have a great night wherever, you're from, wherever you are. And we look forward to you know, seeing you next time. Thank, thank you, Dr. Valverde. Thank, Thank you. you. Everybody have a good evening. It's been a, it's been a pleasure for you me. Too. Thank you Thank very you. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care.